All right, would you turn to Matthew 1? Matthew 1, we're going to be reading the first 16 verses of Matthew 1. If you're using your Bible or if you're using your iPhone, all is good. Um, You'll know where to find that. And uh, before we read these words, um, just uh, let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words that you have inspired, these words that uh, inform us of who you are, that you've revealed yourself to us through them, and through this also you've revealed uh, yourself in Jesus Christ to us, and for that we are thankful. And so Lord, we thank you for these words, may they be a blessing upon our hearts and upon our lives, and may we carry all that with us as we go out from this place here today. In your name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Matthew 1, verses 1 through 16. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Amenadab, Amenadab the father of Nashon. Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, Abiud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Iliad, Iliad the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathan, Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ." Thus far the reading of God's word here this morning. And all God's people said. Yes. God's word. And what we just read is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And it seems that the only interesting thing about this genealogy is its names. And whether or not I can pronounce those names. And as you listened, you either laughed or you admired. You either think that I have it all wrong or at least you admire my willingness to say them out loud publicly. And yet, we wonder, why bother? Why bother reading the genealogy, let alone write it in the Bible? What good does it do? Why bother? I think that there are two good reasons, and before I get to them, let me first say that this genealogy records for us the advent of grace. If advent is described as the time of anticipation and expectancy, then let me tell you that this genealogy is pregnant with grace. So first off, genealogies tell us something about all the stories. The Christmas account actually happened. It's a fact. That's what this genealogy tells us. And it tells us something about all the stories, all the stories that we love. Fairy tales, great stories, you know, Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty, Lord of the Rings, Peter Pan, Hercules, King Arthur, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Moby Dick, the list goes on. Those great stories didn't really happen. They're not factually true, right? Correct. And yet, there's something, there seems to be a longing in the human heart that we want fiction to satisfy. Because deep in the human heart, there's a desire to dream bigger than our own reality. There's a desire for the supernatural. There's a desire for a love that never dies. There's a desire to somehow not age, but live long enough to realize our creative dreams. 
There's a desire to fly. There's a desire to communicate with other non-human beings like angels. There's a desire to triumph over evil. The well-told stories, whether movies or books or plays, they have all of those fabulous aspects to them. It's as if they have some magic because they have all those things wrapped up in there. And if those stories are told well, for a moment we find them incredibly moving. We find them incredibly satisfying because even though we know somehow factually that these things didn't happen, our hearts long for enchantment. And we sense for a moment that we really are enchanted. We hear beauty and the beast and we sense, you know, there must be a love that can break us out of our own beastliness that we've created for ourselves. Here's Sleeping Beauty, and we discover that maybe we really are in a sleeping enchantment, and there is a handsome prince or somebody, a noble prince, who can come and destroy that enchantment. And then there's Peter Pan and the Never Never Land and, and the desire to be young and innocent. We read these stories, we hear these things, and it stirs something deep within us. Our hearts believe, or want to believe, that these things are true. Even though the stories aren't true, our minds say it's just a story. But our heart says, I want to believe. And along comes Christmas. Now, here's the story about someone from out of this world who breaks into this world and has miraculous powers. He can calm the storm and raise people from the dead and heal people. Then his enemies turn on him and he's put to death and it seems like all hope is over. But then he rises from the dead and he saves everyone. So what do we do with a story like that? We read that and we say, another great story. Wait till Pixar gets their hands on this. The screenplay is going to be incredible. <laughs> we'll cheer and it'll make us feel good and then we'll leave the theater and we'll get back to reality. It looks like Christmas story is just one more story. But the book of Matthew says no. It doesn't start with once upon a time. It doesn't start within a galaxy far, far away. It starts with this is the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus Christ is not one more story pointing to the deep longings of our hearts. Jesus Christ is the overarching reality to which all stories point. Jesus is real. Jesus really happened. Jesus Christ has come from that ideal world, we, you might say heaven, that we just know is there. We sense it's there, and our hearts know it. Our heads might say no, 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 but, but he's come from that place. And he is broken. No, he has punched a hole into the concrete slab between the ideal and the real, and he has come into our world. Now, if he is right, if, Jesus, if what Jesus says is right, and he is, if the Bible is right, and it is, if Matthew is right, and he is, then guess what? There is an evil sorcerer in this world, and we are under his enchantment. There has been a noble prince who has broken that enchantment. There is a love that we can never part from. We will win. We will defeat death. The world was created by God, created with angels, created for us. That's what God says, has said, is saying, will continue to say. In other words, even though all those other stories aren't factually true, the fact is that the true story of Jesus Christ gives all of those best stories elements of truth and reality. Let me give you one example. You know there's a place in that, uh, in that movie called Hook. How many of you have seen that movie Hook? With, it's about Peter Pan. All right, some of you. All right, there's a place where Maggie Smith, she's playing the, the part of, of Wendy in the Peter Pan story, but now she's old. 
And, and Peter Pan is now a grown-up Peter Pan. And he claims that he has amnesia. But he kind of senses that the stories about him, that the stories of the past are true. And at one point, Wendy looks at him and says, Peter, the stories are true. And if you understand the genealogy of Jesus, if you understand what the Bible is saying, you'll get a thrill because you'll realize that we are all Peter Pans and that we all have amnesia. And Matthew is saying to us, Peter, the stories are true. So let me be clear. Because Jesus' story is true, it gives an element of truth to all other stories. They kind of pick up on the hints and truths of it, and they incorporate little parts of it, but they're not the whole truth. Yet they all point to the longings in our heart, which only Jesus Christ can satisfy. Amen? You're afraid to say amen because you think the sermon's over, right? <laughs> amen? Amen. amen. All right. The second thing this genealogy shows us is how Jesus Christ turns the world's values completely upside down. Now, this might look like a genealogy to you. That's what we call it. But back in the day, it really wasn't. It's a resume. You see, in older times, your family, your pedigree, your clan, the people that you were connected to, that was your resume. Therefore, a genealogy is essentially the way in which anyone recommended himself or herself to the world, saying, this is my lineage, this is who I am. By the way, back then, as today, and today as back then, people monkeyed with their resume. For example, if you started college A and you flunked out, and then you started college B and you graduated... College A probably will not appear on your resume, right? We'll just leave that out, you know? <laughs> it's kind of a false start. So why even bother having it in there? You know, we, we all tend to leave parts out of our resume that might not make us look so good. Of course, as I said, in the old times, people did that too. But Jesus does the opposite. Jesus does the very opposite. There are some amazing values stated in this genealogy. It is unlike any other ancient genealogy we have ever seen. And the first thing to notice here is that there are five women in this genealogy. In ancient times, women just weren't there. You didn't put women in there. Why? In those days, in those cultures, they weren't important. Yet Jesus has women in his genealogy, and you might call them gender outsiders. More than that, most of the women that are named are Gentiles. Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth, you know, Canaanites and Moabites. These people were third-class citizens according to the rest of Israel. They were not allowed into the tabernacle. They were not allowed into the center of the holy temple. You see... They were unclean. They were racially unclean. So what we see is that there's also racial, racial outsiders, and yet they are in Jesus' genealogy. <laughs> and guess what? Not just gender outsiders and racial outsiders, but there are also moral outsiders in this genealogy. Matthew goes out of his way to talk about some of the most sordid and nasty and immoral and sinful incidents in the Bible out of which Jesus Christ came. For example, if you go back to verse 3 where it says Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, do you know what happened there? That was an incestuous act. Tamar tricked her father-in-law Judah into sleeping with her. It might have been an attempt to right an injustice, but it was an act of incest. It was against the law of God. It was against the Mosaic law. And you know, even though Jesus descended from Perez and not Zerah, Matthew puts both Perez and Zerah, who are twins, he puts Judah and Tamar in there. Why? 
to make sure that we, the readers, remember the whole story. And we don't just gloss over some details. Then, of course, Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho, a Canaanite prostitute. Rahab, the great-grandmother of King David. Oh, ah, King David. Now, there's somebody that you want in your genealogy. I mean, you want royalty on your resume. Yeah, yeah King David, ah, I'm from him. But his great Nana was a prostitute. Then the genealogy says, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Well, that's weird. <laughs> what was her name? Why doesn't Matthew just put her name in there like he did with the other four women? Why not name her? Well, let me tell you who Uriah was. Uriah was one of David's best friends. When David was running for his life from Saul and his life was at stake and his life was hanging from a thread every minute, a group of men gathered around him and they went out into the wilderness with David. They put their lives on the line. They were his mighty men. They were fugitives with him and they risked everything to save his life. Uriah was one of them. One of his very best friends. A man who had risked his life for him. And later on, when David became king and he looked at Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and he wanted her, he loved her so. So what David did was he arranged to have Uriah killed so that he could marry Bathsheba, Bathsheba out of whom came Solomon. So you know why Matthew leaves Bathsheba's name out, don't you? Matthew is not slighting Bathsheba. He is slamming David. David is the adulterer. He should have known better. David is the murderer. He should have known better. So here, in Matthew's genealogy, we have moral outsiders Adulteresses, adulterers, incest, prostitution. We have cultural outsiders. We have racial outsiders, gender outsiders. And they are all in his genealogy. And we remember that the law of Moses precluded all of these people from entering the presence of God. And yet here they are in the genealogy because he is saying, this is my lineage, this is who I am. Jesus is owning them. You see, on one hand, these people were excluded by culture, excluded by respectable society, even excluded by, from the law of God. But Jesus Christ is bringing them in. And so he's saying to us as we read this, it doesn't matter your pedigree. It doesn't matter how low you are in the social ladder. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've killed people. It doesn't matter if you are the hitman for the mafia. The grace of Jesus Christ invites you in. And on the other hand, it's saying, look at this King David. Look at this great guy. He's a man, not a woman. He's a Jew, not a Gentile. He's royalty. He's not poor. Yet he has done something far worse than anyone else in the history of the Bible. And yet there he is. Why? Because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace which spells peace for you and for me. Glory to God in the highest, the angels sang, and on earth peace through grace. Everyone needs the grace of Jesus Christ, even the greatest. No one, not even the worst, can fail to receive the grace of Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, male and female sit down as equals. Jews and Gentiles stand beside each other. One race or another race crowd together. Moral and immoral are on the same level. We are all the same. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you accept the good news, prostitute and king sit down as equals. Amazing. So have you 
really, really understood the honor of being a believer? Do you realize the honor of being a Christian? Do you realize that, that, that King David has nothing on you? Jesus is not ashamed of us. That's what he's telling us in this genealogy. That's why we are all in his genealogy. Hebrews 2 says that he's not ashamed to call us his siblings. It also means, of course, that Jesus Christ's values are different. The world values pedigree. The world values money. The world values race. The world values class. But Jesus Christ turns that all upside down and he says it matters not. The things that are so important out there are not so important here in the kingdom. So you see, genealogies tell us a lot. And this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This is the advent of grace. May his peace be upon us. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for the advent of grace. We ask that, that as we ponder what it means that the deepest longings of our hearts are indeed fulfilled through your Son, Jesus Christ, we realize perhaps that Jesus is a lover of the poor, a lover of the marginal, a lover of justice, a lover of equality. And when we think of these things, they bring us peace. So we pray, Lord, that in the busyness of Christmas that we might not forget that the point is that Jesus Christ brings us grace. We pray that you will place your peace within us. It is in his name we pray. Amen.